Right, so it's day 103 of my attempt to plant a tree every single day for 2023. It is, it's coming to evening, <laughs> 103, uh, so uh, let's get on with it. Right, so a couple of times recently I found myself discussing what my favourite fruit is with people, and it's generally a difficult question to answer because the instinct is to say mango, and that's not a bad answer, but it, it's not the only real contender. But it did get me thinking about what is my favourite fruit tree. Um, and mango is again a really strong contender, but so is today's tree. So today's tree is actually Anona squamosa, which is the custard apple, and that is going in a little area which is quite densely planted already. So this is the area where we've got our little Kegelia, the sausage tree, and we've got the amla, the uh, Indian gooseberry, and some lychees, and some palm trees, and there's already a pre-established avocado and acacia right on the edge of that, and quite close to a big clump of bamboo. Um, and so this is going to be quite a dense area, and that does bring me to one of the real selling points for custard apples. So custard apples, one big selling point is they're a really, really hardy tree. They, they can they can take an awful lot of abuse, even when quite young and tender, and spring straight back from it when the rains hits. They they, they will often sulk if they get abused in for the dry season, and then it's only when the rain comes that you then see, oh, I didn't actually kill it, which is always a relief. Um, but one of the biggest things for me is that they are so unrelated to most other trees you're going to be planting. So most of the trees you're going to be planting in a fruit forest are angiosperms, which are your flowering plants. And those are broadly divided into two categories, your, your monocots, which have one little leaf when they first come out of the seed, and your dicots, which have two little leaves when they first come out of the seed. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the broad idea. And your monocots are things like your dracaenas and your bamboo and your palm trees, and they're quite good for interplanting between your dicots, so things like your guavas and your mangoes. Usually, it's quite a good thing to put something like bamboo or palms or dracaenas in between those because they're very distantly related. It's a very long time since they shared a common ancestor, and so they've diverged a long, long way. But then you have a couple of plants that fall outside of that little dichotomy. So, so, so sometimes you could, you could go all the way outside of the, the flowering plants altogether. You could go to something like a ginkgo tree, which does produce an edible fruit, but I'm not convinced I could get them to grow here. I do want to try. Uh, but you also have this group within the angiosperms, which often is more of a collection of unrelated things that split off before uh, the monocots and the dicots sort of diverged from one another. Um, and in that group is a family called the Ananasi, which includes the custard apples, the sour sops, and the monoon that we planted a little while ago. And they are so unrelated to most of your other plants that their chemical defenses are very, very different. And one of the reasons you can, one of, one of the ways you can see this is when they're healthy, very little eats them that eats anything else. So we do have a couple of butterflies that eat only custard apples, but generally speaking, if this is growing in a healthy, happy environment, that's all. You don't get generalists eating your custard apple trees. You, you do get ants farming scale sometimes on the fruit themselves as they're developing, because they take a while to develop. And in fruit, generally speaking, there's a lot less toxicity. Even when it's not ripe and it's still defending itself, it's less well defended than the plant proper. And you will occasionally find a really unhealthy plant will get an awful lot of other sap-sucking insects move in. But for the most part, these are very well defended plants, which do not have the same pests as any of your other trees, which is why I can put this much closer to say a lychee tree than I would usually put another lychee tree. It doesn't matter if their canopy is in intermingled, it's actually pretty good if they do. They won't for long, the lychee tree will get taller than the custard apple. Uh, the acacia and the, the kegelia, which are also close by, will shoot way up beyond the, the level of this. Uh, but things like the phoenix are actually going to benefit from the protection this is going to give them against the lychee, because the phoenix, although it's a palm tree, it is more closely related to that lychee tree than this little custard apple tree, which is just wonderful to me, uh, just because it doesn't look like it should be that way at all. Uh, but chemically speaking, they are very, very distinct trees, and it's a really useful thing. And one of the things that makes that particularly useful is they are very happy as an under canopy tree. So this will become quite a dense area, and to have the maximum layers of fruiting, you do get a little bit short of things that are going to be happy right on the bottom layer there, and custard apples are usually very, very happy in that role. Right, so that should be everything for today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, thank you for making it this far even so. Um, please tune in again tomorrow. I will be planting something different. I don't know what yet, but that will be the fun. We will find out. Right, so today's wildlife extra is a little frog, who is probably the closest frog there is to being a Darwinian demon. The idea of a Darwinian demon 
is an organism that has sort of beaten the game, so an organism that reproduces infinitely, never dies, and has no real threats. Now this does have threats, it gets eaten by things like boomslangs, twig snakes. One of the things that's incredibly good at is surviving pollution and surviving temperatures. So whereas most frogs have very brief activity periods to account for their weather requirements, this little guy can be active almost year-round, and it can be without food and without water for an extraordinary long, long period of time, so they can actually survive without food for over a year in some cases. They can also remain in full sun in the tropics for a full day without their temperature fluctuating by more than about a degree. They have incredible moisture retention and incredible uh, temperature control. They, they are very, very good at reclaiming water. Their waxy skin barely loses any liquid. And they don't want to be in the full sun, obviously, but they go white usually, which means that their, their body then reflects most of the heat, and they are very, very resilient little creatures. As you can probably see, they are also very springy and very very good at climbing. The one little downside of being a great tree frog, Caramanda Zarampolina, that stops them from being a real Darwinian Darwin is their reproduction. So they are incredibly fussy about where they breathe. They need uh, woody branches usually overhanging open water, uh, which is not that universal. And the water does need to be not polluted because their young are much more chemically sensitive than they are. And they create this foam nest, which is usually several males and one female, sometimes several females, uh, making this basically white foam that hangs from those branches over the water and as the tadpoles hatch they feed on that foam and then drop down into the water and continue the little cycle. But that breeding behaviour also means this little guy is sort of behaviourally immune to things like chitrid because they never actually have to come into contact with standing water. They breed from outside of it. So the adult itself isn't at risk from any pathogens in the water. So even if those tadpoles are lost, the adult still has an opportunity to breed elsewhere and they are just really neat and just phenomenally hardy little frogs.